Okay, so I think that anyway we can start. We, if we are all, yeah. So I'm very glad to be here. My name is Mario Cacciatore and I'm a composer. Um, I have the chance to collaborate with Biennale as tutor for the newborn uh, electronic music studio of the CHIM. And in the last 10 years, I had the chance to have several projects in different electronic music studio, such as the IRCAM, the ZKM, the DAD Experimental Studio Freiburg, uh, the Experimental Studio in, in Basel. And I think that maybe all the experiences I made were useful to understand how it's possible to make the same things in several ways. Behind the habitude of the composer, I think that it's quite important to look for the theory and the background structures that can support anyway the local project and the local strategies we want to adopt. When I started my PhD between the Hochschule in Basel and the Catholic University in Porto, I made a PhD in new technologies applied to composition. I was interested in developing something of mine um, for Max and for the live electronics, and I was quite interested in formalize my habitude trying to find a way in fact, to communicate to other composers, to other students, to all people that could be interested, how it's possible to record a path and to understand how to optimize every step that we must make when we talk about Amphet Mixed Music. Um, at the beginning I was saying I'm a composer and I must say that 90% of my activity is made for the mixed music, so I especially work with acoustic instruments and, uh, and electronics, both with live electronics or just sound files. I'm not scary to say that the strategy of the deferred time or the false real time, we can see this maybe this afternoon, in fact, when we talk a little bit more during the workshop. It's something that I really appreciate and that sometimes can give more time to the composer to work in studio and to really feel and understand what we want to put in a concert, what we want to sound in a concert without having the risk of the live electronics that is a sort anyway, every time of lottery, we cannot ever be sure anyway uh, of what we have when we talk about live electronics. This is something that somehow we must accept. So I just took and fed some minutes waiting for some other people, but I think that really now we can start and fed with this talk. So um, in this speech, I will talk about my Max collection that has been called Mix, that means in fact music mixed in French. And before anyway, I will give some information about, I will give some notion about what is the software architecture and what does it mean in fact to talk about software architecture and all the differences that we have in fact in the state of art in the, in the musical software that now are on the market. And so what is the difference that we have in the background conceiving in fact of all these softwares? Um, if I must make a little summary, let's say, of, should I, okay, perfect, of what we will talk about today. So I will give at first some software architecture definitions that is quite important in fact, to, under, to really understand what we are talking about. Um, I will make a little focus about the software architecture strategies for musical application because anyway, every, uh, we can say that, uh, yeah, that every app and every software has somehow an architecture, but now we are not interested in understanding how, for example, Word, Excel, and other software that normally we use every day function. Um, we will make, in fact, the difference between what is a software architecture and what is a graphic design pattern. 
And so, finally, I will give, in fact, my personal definition, my personal view about what I call widget programming. So, finally, we can talk about, in fact, my Max package. And so, before to talk about my package mixed, I will make a sort of list of all the other collections that you can find on the market right now. Finally, I will talk about, in fact, the mixed architecture, so to rely with what I will say at the beginning of this speech. So, if we talk about, in fact, the definition of software architecture, we can see that uh, we can find more than 500 definitions. For example, there is a website. It's just, in fact, if you Google software architecture definition, I think that you should see in the first place is anyway this link um, where you can find in fact the summary of all the definitions that has been taken by the PhD dissertations, books, etc. Um, uh, let's say there is not in fact just one only view about what is software architecture, what is software strategy, what is a design pattern. Let's say that everybody, in fact, who want to give his own definition. Um, it's the, the egocentric part of being informatics, maybe, too. Uh, let's say that the need for research in software structures was first acknowledged in the 60s. Since the 70s, research has been paying considerable, considerable attention to software design. Its premise was that the design as an activity is distinct from implementation, given its demand in terms of special notation techniques and tools. We are in the 80s, and the focus of software engineering research shifted away from specific software design and increasingly towards integrating designs and design process into a broader context of software process and management. The result of such integration was the implementation of languages absorbed many of the notation and the techniques developed for software design. Research on software architecture was really born in the 90s. We were talking about unfed design, but also it's important to, to understand why. Until the 1998, all the softwares were just in the form of scripts. The first software with a graphic tool, you know, with graphic tools, just appeared in 1988, and it was a software that, if I'm not wrong, it was called the Toolbox uh, version 4. It was something like this, and it was not a software for musical applications. So we are in the 90s, and the term architecture finally replaced that of design, suggesting notion of codification, abstraction, standards, formal training, and style. From the 90s to the 2000s, software architecture definitely arose from a sub-discipline to a prominent domain in software engineering. Uh, for example, job titles as the technical architect, chief architect, now flourish in the software industry. For example, we can imagine that we have an association, a worldwide institute of software architect. You can Google anyway the website. It's just, in fact, Worldwide Institute Software Architects. And so we have, in fact, this special forum where we can find, for example, um, people chatting about how to structure, how to replace, how to, to integrate, in fact, different softwares among themselves. This, we will see, is one of the most important goals of think about software architecture before, before conceiving and programming the software itself. Um, I was saying we give some definition. For example, this is one that I like. And in this case, in fact, we have the focus about uh, the, the architecture is a sort, uh, I always made like this, uh, it works, uh, and so the architecture is the way with which the things work. Architecture is defined by the recommended practice as the fundamental organization of a system embodied in its component, you can read by yourself. So, uh, we have another definition that uh, okay, I lost the connection, and so I make like this. Um, 
we have in this case unfettered the software architecture of a program of computing system is the structure of the structures. That is true anyway, because we can also conceive, for example, a software that is a sort of puzzle, a sort of summary of different parts that has been taken from different softwares, from previous releases. For example, we can think about GarageBand uh, and Logic. A lot of parts are the same, it's just that Logic has more features. Is that, that for example, Final Cut and Movie, a lot of parts are just the same, it's just that Final Cut has more features, but we can recognize, in fact, the same graphic tools, the same way to recall the sound files, the video files, etc. What does it mean? It means that, for sure, between these two couples of software, we have an architecture that is the same, it's just that for Logic and Final Cut, we have something that is much more developed, much more deeper. We see another definition, so this is longer. Software architecture go beyond the algorithms and data structure of computation. Designing and specifying the overall system structure emerges as a new kind of problem, etc. All these definitions, anyway, has been taken by dramatic important books about this topic. So, anyway, I just not taken fact, the first three definitions I found on the way. Um, I think that are quite long and it's not so easy to, to understand what we talk about. So I must say that I prefer this other definition that is shorter and is much more clear. The architecture of a software system, shortly called software architecture, is the structure of the system constituted by the parts of the system, the relation among the parts and their visible properties. So why I prefer this definition, uh, we can say that various authors tend to identify the architecture with this description. No, the description of the, of the architecture we will see is a part of the documentation that is quite important, in fact, to, to give, the, uh, uh, we can say, to give the possibility to update, in fact, that software in the future when, for example, the operating system will change, when hardware will change, etc. But, however, in, uh, in this definition provided, concepts are kept distinct. We have, in fact, one part that says the software architecture is the structure of the system, and we also say that a software architecture is the summary of different parts that work together and that communicate among themselves. This is dramatically important. It's dramatically important that different parts can be uh, at the same time both, both independent uh, and in a way related in a whole homogeneous concept. Why it's so important to talk about in fact, this topic and why we will see in fact, a good realization of a software must pass from a good theory, a good plan, let's say, before starting to script and to program really the software itself. We have three skills that every good software should own. Um, first, first, modifiability. Every software architecture must conceive, in fact, that the change of a subpart does not face the change of other subparts. What does it mean? I have my software, for example, for, uh, for capturing uh, pitch and analyzing pitch from a live streaming. I have other features, for example, I have a sound file player and I have my master output uh, module, etc. If I want to change the, uh, the algorithm for the capturing of the pitch, this does not mean that I should program again all the other subparts. Otherwise, it means that the architecture behind, in fact, my product, uh, it has not been conceived in a proper way. 
the next programmer uh, both we are or other people for example it's normal in a commercial market that anyway we work on a software and after our contract finish and uh, there will be a, another person working on the same software on the same code we should in fact be gentle and give the possibility if needed just to change in fact the part of the code that we want to implement that we want to uh, update without affecting all the other parts that constitute the software itself. The second skill that is quite important, portability. What does it mean? It means that a good software should not be intimately related with an operating system. This, the, and this I think it's quite easy to, to understand. I think that everybody that owns a Windows software, for example, know what does it mean and fed it to suffer when when somebody says, oh, but I'm sorry, this software just runs on Mac OS computers. So when we have the same architecture that can be translated on another operating system that can be, for example, with Windows, that can be Linux, that can be an operating system that will appear on the market in 20 years. We don't know what we will have in 20 years, but I think that everybody could be, in fact, sorry if Max will not be in fact available. For example, you know, um, with the release of Catalina, we have in fact this very bad news that we cannot use right now AudioSculpt anymore. AudioSculpt is a software that is part of the IRCAM forum and um, if you use this software, I strictly advise you do not update in fact your, your operating system with Catalina because all the softwares that run in 32 bits will not be uh, will not be available uh, uh, anymore. So this is a, a problem, and this means that who developed the software must update and fit the portability of the architecture in order to give the possibility to run the same software on the new operating system that are appearing and that will appear in the future in the market. Third skill that every software architecture must own, own, reuse. What does it mean? For example, I made my software for the pitch shift uh, correction uh, in a live concert. I have some parts that can be useful for, for another software I will conceive uh, for live capturing with video, I don't know what. What does it mean? It means that if I have a good model for the sound out, for the sound input, uh, um, for the graphic, uh, for the communication with the user, for graphics, uh, I can reuse those parts in, a, in another software without programming again the code of that part. So, so modifiability, portability, reuse. When you conceive a software, if you don't see these three skills, it means that something can be for sure improved. There is a definition that is different from what is a software architecture, you know. Uh, I was saying at the beginning that we started to we started to talk about style of architecture, style of software, and now it's quite in fact fashion and funny, funny to listen to some programmers that just in fact says to other colleagues how to code and how to structure a software itself to say, I feel to be a uh, software stylish. So um, the notion of style appeared during the 80s and, and we can say this in fact. The architecture style is a set of principles implying ways of elaborating information and ways in which various software program sections interact with each other. Um, we have a large series of software styles that we could describe in in this morning, I think that um, I can just, uh, I will just talk about, in fact, the, the architecture style that can be related, in fact, with the musical application in the sense that 
we are not interested now to understand and to make a carousel of all the styles of architecture uh, that we can find on the on market software. It's just in fact we relate this speech just for the musical application. So the most important architecture style for sure is what we can call the pipe filter style. The pipe filter style uh, enables sequential data processing. In this case, the components of the architecture are filters reading data streams on its, uh, on its uh, the, uh, the inputs and producing data streams for the, for the outputs. Uh, we can say that connectors uh, are pipes transmitting the output streams of one filter to inputs of another. So we have something that goes out from one pipe and that goes in the, the following one, etc. Two or more filters can operate in parallel, like for example we can see in this figure. Uh, in this case, in fact, the sequence of the output of an upstream filter while it continues elaborating its own input sequence. In the pipe filter style, components and connectors behave in particular ways and should be configured so as to enable sequential data processing. All the components called filters read data streams on its, uh, on its inputs and produce data streams on their outputs. And this normally applies typically uh, with transformation to every element for each step that we have in the chain we build. Um, the connectors serve as the streams and they transmit in fact this information that normally is much, uh, is more and more complex. So uh, we can see the transformation of data or the use of data on each step. Yeah, that in this case technically we call on each pipe, but that at the end constitute the style and the architecture itself. So in this case, in fact, we say that the connector functions uh, uh, as a pipe conducting data from a sink in one component to a source in another component. All the components must be sequentially connected. What does it mean that they can see the step A, the step B, the step C, the step D? Um, in some slides, in fact, we will see how this is the most classical uh, architecture style just because if you think this is the way in which every mixer channel has been in fact structured. We have in fact the same, the sound input, we have the preamplification, we have the equalization, we have the compression, we have the pump pot, we have the master fader for each channel and we cannot jump in fact this path and we always have all of them in a sequential way. So this is, for example, one simple way to think what is a so-called pipeline architecture style. Um, for example, we can see another architecture style that is quite common and is the client server. So in this case, in fact, we have something different. In the pipeline architecture, all the, the arrows that can, destroy, that can describe the architecture of fact goes just in one direction, for example, from the bottom to above, yeah, from a bone to bottom. Uh, in the client server style instead, we have a double way of communication in the sense that we have a server and we have something, some machine, some people that uh, 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 is taking information to upload the same information on the remote part of the system. So, uh, the server's interfaces describe services or by and large, for example, functionalities offered and the client's interfaces describe the user services. 
The clients initialize communication and prepare an answer from the servers. Clients must know server identity while the converse does not hold. So the client's identity is communicated with the service query. Connectors represent an interaction protocol, including a question and an answer in the base case. It can also prompt clients to begin a session with the service to respect eventual regulations concerning the order of queries or close the sessions. So what does it mean? Uh, I'm just reading, in fact, uh, the, the things I'm reading are parts of my thesis, and so, so I prefer to better explain some concepts, and this is the reason for which sometimes you can take, in fact, I'm reading some notes. Um, if we have a double way of communication, we cannot just rely this direction to the hardware structure. In a pipe filter connection, we can just say, in fact, yes, yes, but the data streaming of communication just goes in this way because the hardware has been structured that the, um, the, the streaming of electrons anyway goes on that direction because the hardware itself works in that way. When we have a double way of communication, we have an introduction of another need. We need a protocol of communication, otherwise client server should not communicate. The protocol of communication, for example, if we consider what is normally used in the musical application is the MIDI protocol, the OSC, the TCP IP, etc. So we need to fix some rules of language in order to, to allow the communication among parts that are not physically related in the same play place. This is, for example, if we think about, I don't know if you know uh, Orchidee, that it is a software that it was always a part of the IRCAM forum where you always ask the access to a remote server that contains the sound samples that can be integrated in the, in the orchestration in fact, of the chord or the sound you know, that we are anyway you know, investigating. Or, for example, you know, um, we can recognize a client server. You know, for example, in logic, when uh, you, you, you ask for downloading the app loops. So we have a little part of the software that anyway responds to a client server style. What does it mean this? That in very complex software, different parts can work with parallel architecture styles. We don't recognize the client server style in logic uh, until we don't, need, yeah, we don't need to download something uh, yeah, to, do, yeah, to implement in the local section of our machine. Normally, uh, in our machine, we have a software that works with a pipeline and, uh, uh, style. For example, we see another, another style that is quite common. This is the style that is normal to integrate when we talk about musical installation. So the feedback control loop is that style that needs another hardware at the beginning of the chain, uh, and this hardware works just for collecting data that must be uh, analyzed and integrated in a script that we have in a further path of our chain of our uh, uh, style. So let's say feedback control loop style, uh, we can see how, how it allows the central components and connectors configured so to allow a central component for several actuators through analysis of sensor information. The feedback control loop style is usually used to model a part of a system with a central controller to control one or more actuators. For actuators, this is a, a technical word that we use to say, for example, when we have several laptops, we say that 
Each laptop is, is an actuator of the system that we, that we are using, that we are implementing. So a central controller is used to control one or more actuators by using data from one or more sensors. If we have an installation that use more machines, because for example, we are in a very big hole, and so one machine is not enough for responding to some functions that we want to integrate. And we have, for example, microphones, we have sensors, we have different machines. Normally, we have the same algorithm, the same software that is connected with the ensemble of sensors that give the information and after the software says to each machine she, what the machine must do. In this case, what we have? We have just one machine that has the core of the software. And we know that if we have some troubles, we must not investigate what is going on on 10 computers. We just go on one computer the first one that contains the software itself. All the, all the other laptops are just, in fact, the queue are just, in fact, the actuators of what is happening by the first laptop, by the first computer of the chain. This is quite useful when we have complex systems with a lot of machines that work together. And when we must debug, in fact, quickly, because, because we have a trouble, can happen anyway, when we have live sensors that work, you know. Uh, it can also happen that, for example, a child, while, you know, while working, move or destroy a sensor, we have a part of the software that, for example, does not work anymore. Uh, and imagine if we should run on 10 computers, understanding which computer is, uh, uh, in that moment is not working anymore. This could be quite tricky. So, so it's better to rely all the core of the system in just one laptop and the other uh, and the other machine that can be, for example, also also mechanical instruments, player piano. Um, MIDI instruments that just work alone without a player being there, you know. Physical models that work alone just because they, they, they receive data from another machine. Um, we are not obliged to debug each machine, we just debug one machine, the first one, and so it's quite useful and it's quite safe, let's say. And we see another architecture style that is quite common, and this is the style of the, for example, the so-called laptop ensembles. So we have um, we have one computer that works as server because, for example, we take some files, we take information, we take the rules, we take part of the scripts, we take something, and this part normally. Uh, is connected with a communication protocol that allows anyway a, a, a double and multiple communication without the trouble of the latency. So normally we use the TCP IP uh, or other data streaming communication protocol that uh, anyway does not suffer about this stuff. In this case, I, uh, we can say we use all the protocol that we know except um, for the MIDI that when applied to a multi-session uh, a multi-session architecture could suffer a slight of latency problems. The shared data style focuses on access to data shared among various components. Uh, it integrates such components as, for example, databases, for instance, maintaining shared status and a set of uh, a set of independent components operating on data. So each unit, for example, in this graphic, we can see we have unit one, two, three, four. And we can think that these are four laptops that anyway can be connected with a couple of, uh, of jack to an audio interface. So if we see locally, each computer is independent and we can, in fact, broadcast our data and our elaborations. 
But at the same time, each computer can take information from a data server. And this data server can also stock some information that is coming from, from another machine, sharing the same data to all the components that in that moment have been connected and fed to the system. So this is the goal of the laptop ensemble. Normally, if we want to see the point of the system, the data storage can be a server, and, and in this case, we just unfed We can take some information and we can store some information. If we want an elaboration, in the sense that if we want that the same machine that contains a list of some files, I don't know what, or just the rules of the game, is also the machine that contains that part of the scripts concerning the data elaboration in itself, we need, um, just a moment, I, uh, I just lost myself, just a moment. So, uh, if we just want to take and fetch some files, it's just a, a server and it's something that does not need a, uh, a true computer. Uh, if we want to have a, a live elaboration that passes from one machine to other machine, being sure that anyway the same data streaming can go around all the components connected in that moment on the system, the machine that in this graphics has been called data storage, it must also integrate somehow a clock synchronization. So it is, so, um, you know, in informatics, the concept of time runs on several levels. We have the time of the CPU, we have the time of the main card, we have the time of the sound card, we have the time of the audio interface. So if we talk about time in informatics, we could in fact, in fact give up this subject of today and just to talk about yeah, the, the, the clock strategies and the clock problems in informatics right now. Um, this is the reason for which we always need, when we have several machines connected to the same system, one machine that is able to communicate with all the other ones that must be responsible of the clock synchronization. So we say in fact, the pipeline that is really the most common, uh, really, if you think about uh, I think that 70% of the software on the market somehow integrates a pipeline and structure. The, the client server that is quite useful when we want to use a cloud, when we have a large list of data that can be extrapolated, used and uploaded in a system and that we use in that moment locally, we just use a part of them locally for what we are doing in that moment. Um, the third one we saw, the feedback control loop, that is normally the, um, the, the architecture style for some kind of sound installations. And the shared data that is normally the most classical architecture style for laptop ensembles. So, so this is how we run the information along a chain, along a path that is made by hardware that can be, for example, sensors, uh, hardware that can be servers, uh, and hardware that can be uh, the, the computers that we use. Um, one thing before to run again. When we talk about software architecture, we don't talk about hardware, uh, the hardware architecture. And somehow, we also have another software architecture that is just conceived for make the communication with how the hardware has been structured and how the, the operating system can transmit the information to the hardware components. 
the, um, the conceiving of the hardware components started the, at the beginning of the 60s when the first transistors appeared on the market and the first CPUs were, were implemented in experimental computers, in supercomputers of the 60s. But the architecture of a CPU has nothing related with the architecture style when we talk about software architecture. These are two different layers that we can see and, fight, uh, and that we can, uh, we can see uh, in every machine, in every, uh, in every software that runs uh, uh, in our computers. So the hardware architecture, the software architecture, and how to structure the graphic interface. That is uh, something dramatically important since the, um, the burn of this software that was called, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, a talk box for, and that was image, a software, in fact, um, for, for storage, uh, for storage uh, items in big, uh, in big markets. So uh, 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 it was a commercial software with other purposes different than music. If we see what we were saying before, so the hardware, the software, etc., yeah, we can make a summary through these graphics. We have the hardware that is really the hardware components that we use, that we have in our machine. The, 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 the digitation of the mechanical components, what does it mean? Every computer has a background code that is dramatically important for giving the information to the CPU. Um, and after, we have the modules, that means, in fact, we have the software itself with all the algorithms that the software integrates. And finally, we have the user interface, how the computer can communicate with us how we can use the software. All of us know how much is important to have a user-friendly, we use now this term to mean a graphic interface that is useful, that works quickly and in the right way for performing a software life. So, a little bit of theory about this. We have three very important parts that we must always consider um, in a graphic user interface. For example, the module is the software program score, whose algorithm gather uh, and elaborate and render data from and for users. The controller enables users to input data. The view, uh, Instead, enables user access to software status and data output. The arrangement of these three elements brings life to different kinds of what we call, for a, for a technical point of view, design patterns. So, the software architecture is how the information runs along the time um, through all the machines. The design pattern is how the module, the controllers, and the view have been structured by the software styler. So the most classical architectural pattern for the graphic user interface we use is called MVC, Model View Controller. What does it mean? I have my little man, and I'm very happy this was designed by me, and I think that is quite primitive, but I like it very much. Um, so we have the user that uses the controller. For example, I move the slider on a VST, etc. We talk about this. So I move the controller on the graphic user interface, and these controllers manipulate the model but we don't see the model, we don't see the script working, we just, in fact, manipulate the faders on the VST. And 
the model is able, when receiving the data input, to update the view. For example, you know, um, it's the, um, I don't know if you have in your memory the image of the GRM tools, you know? No, we have in that case uh, a double graphing interface. We can move the little sphere uh, that corresponds to several parameters, and when we move with the mouse that sphere, a list of faders anyway moves in a parallel way just to say, in fact, we are on the x axis on this level, and we are on the, the y axis on that level, etc. So what does it mean that we move a controller, this controller that we are moving talks and give uh, an input data to the algorithm, and the algorithm goes to modify the state, the, the, the viewing uh, of our user interface. This is the most classical uh, architectural pattern for conceiving a graphic user interface. It's what we call model view controller. If we talk about Max, is the, um, the behavior and what we have when we lock a patch, patch just in edit mode. In uh, in the 90s, we had a development of the MVC pattern that has been called MVP, Model View Presenter. So we have a double layer presentation mode. It's, for example, what a period uh, since Max 5 appeared in the market, if we talk about Max. The MVP model was introduced in 2009. And we can have an idea of what is a, an MVP model when we lock a patch and when we fill the presentation mode. So we have another user interface that is another layer of the graphing interface that anyway goes beyond the locked patch in edit mode. I hope I'm clear saying this, guys. Yes. So let's say model view presenter is a derivative of the model view controller architectural pattern whose origin goes back to the early 90s. It's used mostly for building user interfaces. In this case, the presenter takes on the middleman functionality. All presentation logic is pushed to the presenter. So, so we have in the, in, the, in the presentation mode just the controller that the, the user must use. More layers we have in the graphical interface, less independence we give to the user to the user to the user to modify the software. So it's something, for example, when we conceive something for people who, who is not really trained, we just put on that the minimum of controls, just what is important, you know. In that case, we, we lose freedom for sure, but we have a graphing interface that makes the life quite, quite easier for the user that must really use in fact, that software, that, that GUI. Um, while in, we display in fact, the, the, the model data, the presenter governs the way and the model that can manipulate and change all data without understanding how this is going on. On when we just move controls on a presentation, uh, you know, uh, on a presentation layer, we are not responsible about what is going and we cannot change and most of the time we can neither understand how the presentation is communicating with the model that is in the background of the software. Um, the main difference is so that more layers we have, less 
control on the on the on the algorithm and on the way of coding the data inputs we have when using a software. So um, we are at the beginning of the 90s, and uh, I don't know if you you have memory in fact uh, at the end of the 80s in Italy too it was possible to order I don't remember the name I was remember I'm trying to remember from yesterday but really I don't remember how it was called the video telephone the the video telephone that it was possible to book in fact with telecom with the the older societies uh, 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 in France for example we have the same machine with a little screen it was just in fact uh, a screen with the characters in green and it was possible it was a primitive internet uh, network, let's say like this. In France, this, yeah, this telephone was called, in fact, uh, it was called, if I'm not wrong, Intercom. And it was possible to have some information. It was possible to fill some data. For example, it was possible to ask about the weather, to ask about the news, to ask uh, uh, about public, uh, public, numbers, uh, police, uh, fire, uh, etc. And the machine was giving uh, some answers, was giving some answers uh, that was taking from a client server structure for sure. Um, a modification, an update of this system is what we call the model view, view model uh, architectural patterns. So let's think about, for example, all the social platforms that, that, that integrates a chat. And for example, let's focus on WhatsApp. I'm talking with Mario, and I see on my graphic interface what I'm writing on the right and what Mario is writing on the left. But at the same time, Mario is seeing what he is writing on the right and what I'm writing on the left. So we have the same algorithm yeah, that rules the behavior of two different graphic interfaces. But this is the classical case of a M view view M graphical pattern. One view model and two realization of this. This one for the user A and the other for the user B. So, um, in very large software such as, for example, all the those, you know, all what we technically call the onion software Finale, I think that is the most richer Onion software in the sense that we can really see the first uh, software program, the first software programmer that was there, and after uh, his contract uh, finished and another person started again making the same things in, in another part of the software, this is what we call an Onion software. So we can really see the different layers, the, the different moments, historical moments in which that software has been developed. Um, so the PAC model is called the presentation abstraction control. In all these modules, we see, for example, what it was called an MVC architectural pattern. And we have several modules that work together uh, 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 for the same software into, into the same software. Is, for example, what happens all the time that we have a software that, that for example, allows a pop-up window. And when we call a pop-up window, we have a, another list of controls that just work uh, for some specific instruction, for some specific features of that software. So for example, we are in Final Cut, and I want the access just 
to the to the video manipulation and I can call just in fact that part that is an independent software from the audio modification and the and this uh, and the synchronization of all the clips etc um, is much more common at the end in the sense that the MVC architectural pattern is what normally we have in, simple, in simple software such as a plugin. When we talk about larger software as old those, etc., it's better to think about what we call presentation abstraction control pack, also called HMVC, Hierarchy Model View Controller. Why we have two names? The, the pack it was of the 92, and in 98 uh, there was another equipe that maybe they did not study very well, and they, and they published an article saying, we conceived another architecture style that is called HMVC on the following number of the same scientific review, the first equipe saying, I'm sorry guys, but we were invented the same structure eight years ago before the new. So the, uh, it was quite funny and fact to read some story. And so if you read the PAC architectural pattern or the HMVC architectural pattern, uh, anyway, we talk about the same strategy. So let's start and fact to go toward the, the musical applications now. Um, we say that at the beginning that if we consider what happens in um, in a mixer and in most commercially available software programs and visual programming language used for acoustic and mixed music, we can recognize a pipelined software architecture. Now, taking into account the entire ADC duck chain, all data and audio streaming shift algorithms in almost linear fashion. The digital audio workstations, such as Pro Tools, Logic, Digital Performer, Cubase, Nuendo, and a host of other devoted to the structure of every channel track, also draw inspiration from their graphic from the audio processing sequences of the analog mixers, where the input signal is uh, is at first, uh, is, uh, we can say, entered in, and then is modified in some of its components and managed, for example, for the pan pot, and finally sent as an output streaming to the machine with a final general uh, amplitude. Such a scheme replicates assembly chains of analog machine for all of these steps. And thus, a mixer channel scheme sums up wiring rules applicable to audio processing machines. Uh, and today's digital mixers integrate communication protocols enabling digital parameters management of all data for wiring from other external machines. All data communications might be relevant to input as much as the output data since MIDI or OSC protocols, for instance, are both programmed for two-way data communications ways. In most cases, however, digital data are always sent as input in the mixer, gathering, that is, the outside information affecting audio uh, and all these things happens according to a cause-effect relationships. We see that every step is dependent from what is going on to the previous one, etc. The most classical chain that we have in a in analog mixer channel, but that we also can recognize in a DO track, uh, and is the same for Pro Tools, for Logic, uh, for Nuendo, etc., is that, for example, we uh, we have the audio input, we have the the preamplification, we have all the filters for the uh, for the uh, equalization of the signal and we have the compression of the signal, we can have attached and fed some aux so to multiply the number of channels that are integrating, that are flashing and fed that audio streaming in that moment, or, the, or uh, 
another kind of data streaming, for example, the same things also happens for video mixers, for video machines that enables to share the same videos on different tracks, on different monitors. And so finally, we can talk about the signal panning and we have the volume control, we have finally the master fader. So, so this is the most classical pipeline and structure that we find on the classical mixers. And also if we really think the primitive way to think about live electronics, what we have? We have an audio input. We have a series of audio treatments and, and right now we talk about audio treatments that means everything. We, it means the classical audio design such as equalization, compression, reverberation, etc. Uh, and it also means the true data interpretation so to transform the, the audio streaming according to some rules, some algorithms we want to use. And finally, we have the routing and the audio output. So one concept that is important in an architecture style. The routing of the signal has nothing in common with the audio output we want to use. And starting, I think, from one, two slides, it's better, we'll, I will change word and I prefer to talk about audio rendering. So, the routing of the signal is the number of channels that are going out from the software. For example, if I have a four-channel sound file, I have a routing of four, of, of four channels. Uh, at the same time, I can use, anyway, an ambisonic system with 64 channels just to diffuse my software for channels. So, the routing is for four channels, but the, the, the audio rendering that is made through the use of a diffusion algorithm is made for 64 channels. So this is the reason for which a good software should always host a place to split how many channels we have during the data processing and how many physical channels we want to use to diffuse our music. When we have a software that is especially conceived for live concerts, such as, for example, Ableton Live or also Max, how we structure things in Max especially since we gave up the strategy of the wall sound files that runs from the beginning to the end of the piece, like for example what was happening in the first in the mixed music piece until the beginning, the, the, the end of the 80s. I think that the first piece that was integrating this other structure was Jupiter of Philippe Manouri and we are in the 87. Um, we have a computer score. What is a computer score? A computer score is a list of data instructions that affects the software itself in order to change the behavior of the parts and the subparts that comp yeah, that make the whole functionment of the software we are using. It was a dramatic important moment because since the end of the 80s, since the, the strategies that was conceived at the IRCAM, let's say the truth, um, was substantially established in the concept of a timeline in a pipeline and architecture, um, we had a dramatic change in how to structure the different parts that work for a live electronics software. Um, in this case, the software status basically varies through instruction blocks triggered throughout the performance of a piece, so to change uh, independence of the needs prescribed within a score or a predictable external factors. 
In this case, a computer score always and only contains data. And the computer score is able to transform the data um, with two fundamental features. All things will always happen in the same way when we run again the same computer score. All things are simply predictable in the sense that the user knows what will happen because the computer score has been conceived uh, in order to know exactly what will happen when we change the status of our software. If we have a computer score that uh, uh, is not able to give us these true dramatic important points, it means that something is wrong in the programming. If we want to make something a little bit more complex, let's start to play now with the, with the boxes. So this is the classical uh, architecture that we have when microphones appear on stage. Uh, and in this case, in fact, let's say microphones or all the other kind of generators that we can have on stage. I have a list in some slides, so, so we wait. We have the audio input, we have the data input that is able to communicate directly with the computer score. What does it mean? For example, I have a MIDI pedal that sends through, through the MIDI protocol a number that triggers the next the next number of the queue list of the computer score and so this number of the queue list affects and uh, triggers some instructions that affect the audio treatments, the routing of the signals, uh, the audio mastering, the audio rendering, uh, etc. Normally we must have an event counter to display which number of queue lists we are triggering on. So this is another module that we need. Each box that we start to see now in the next graphics are always things that we must program and that uh, in a good architecture style should be independent so to may, to may update them in case of need in the future or to reuse them in other software applications because, because hopefully, in fact, we hope to write more than one piece. So if we want to integrate, for example, in this architecture, we see how we can think to the audio analysis that can be an envelope follower, that can be a, a pitch follower, that can be a comparison with a server that give us some rules to use for, the, um, for, for update the audio treatment algorithm that we are using. Another thing that maybe I did not say, each architecture can be applied to several pieces. So each software, especially when we conceive softwares for live electronics, yes, for sure, we have different pieces, we use different sound files at the beginning. But if each software itself is intimately related with the piece we talk about, the same architecture style can be reused for several pieces. This is the reason for which it's very useful to conceive a nice architecture that can work for several pieces. We just cry once and after we, we reuse the same strategies for all the same pieces that will answer to the same needs. If we make the list of all the kinds of audio generators that is not, I think, so, so elementary in the sense that I had to think a while anyway to make this list. We can see that from the stage what we can have. We can have an audio, uh, an audio input that comes, just a moment. Oh, okay, so we can have an audio input that comes from microphones and we can have an audio streaming that comes from digital data and so it means that comes from uh, an audio file that has been stored in some memories that is connected with my machine, with my software. 
or for example i'm diffusing i'm uh, i'm diffusing some wave generators uh, uh, it can be a simple sinusoid it can be a square wave it can be a physical model so uh, a digital instrument that does not exist physically, but it is the result of another software that is integrated inside a bigger one. So microphone, files, and what I call wave generators. If we talk about, in fact, which kind, uh, from where could I receive data from stage? Yeah, we can think about human interfaces, we can think about MIDI or OSC musical instruments. We can think about sensors. And we can think about some other external machine that use some digital protocols that have been stored also in the software, in the sense that if we have a protocol that my software is not able to understand, there is no need, in fact, to use this protocol on stage. I can uh, understand, uh, I can use that protocol only if both machine, the machine on stage and the machine in the backstage can understand the same language for sure. So this is what I call, so just a moment, I want to stand up a while. So, so this is what I call the general model of a software architecture for live electronics. So, um, Another thing, um, when we make this kind of graphics, if we want to make the things well done, um, we should use a software, a, a special software. Just a moment, I don't remember how it's called it, but it's very nice. And we have some rules about how to draw the arrows, which kind of point for arrows we should use, because each arrow has a different uh, a different meaning. For example, all the arrows that I use means I have something different at the end of the path, but considering what I was having on the previous step. Um, just a moment, I advise you to download this for free anyway. And this called uh, applications, just a moment, I'm... Uh, ta is called Star UML and it's a very nice software for drawing these kind of tables. Star UML. UML is the, the official worldwide language and code for making graphics for all the subjects. We talk about engineering, we talk about uh, architecture, we talk about music. If we want to use the right graphic language, the right graphic standard, we should study this protocol that is called UML. So this is, in fact, what I call, yeah, what I was describing as the general architecture that every live electronic software normally contains. In every box we have the same kind of actors that work for the same things. So we have a very big box for data inputs. And we have MIDI devices, human interfaces, sensors, etc. And we have another big box uh, um, for the audio inputs, so microphones, sound files, and wave generators. And so we have all the other fixes part. Sure, the box that is called the audio treatment is a sort of, of uh, we can say, is an abyss. In the audio treatment parts, we can have all the things that we conceive. So. In the audio treatment blocks, we have all the things that makes magic our pieces. It's just that if we consider in which moment the audio treatment appears in the architecture chain, all the time, the right moment, it will be that one. When we talk about, it's just a pity that just a moment, because if I'm able, okay, let me see. Okay, wonderful. I think that now I can rule my presentation from the smartphone. 
So if we think about, in fact, the, the architecture that normally we use when um, we perform something with two laptops. So this was quite common. For example, I have my MIDI, MIDI keyboard concert at the year coming 2010, and uh, it seems just in fact a few years ago, but in 2010, very, very heavy max patch were running on two or more machines connected on TCP or UDC protocols because it was safer. In this case, I was having one max patcher on one machine for all the sound files and another max patcher for the physical models made in Modelist just to be sure to not have on fat CPU troubleshooting. Okay, I lost again the connection, and I have no chance today, and so I must trigger the slides by hand. Um, in this case, we have one computer A, one computer B. Normally, why I call the computer A server? The computer A, we must have one machine that is responsible for the clock synchronization. It's something that is dramatically important when we talk about time in informatics. First thing that we should ask to ourselves, who is making the rule of timing? And normally we have one machine that is called master and the other machine that is called slave. And we can also like being master or being slave, it depends from the moment. Um, so, so normally, <laughs> So normally, um, the computer B, the slave, give an update of information that is part of the flux that we have um, for, uh, for the final audio rendering. And finally, what is going on from the result from the connection of the two machines is... The, uh, <laughs> it goes toward the audio interface and the diffusion system we are using. I think I must start to run a little bit, guys, because we just have, in fact, half an hour. So um, this is, for example, another architecture that is, in fact, the normal one for the laptop ensembles. If we have more laptops, it's just, in fact, we multiply the columns, it's the same. So I have one one column that is the master one, and all the other columns that are the slave ones. And for sure, where I write computer A, where I write computer B, it just means that in that moment we have the architecture or one of the architecture we were talking before. Okay, let's change just a moment and fat topic. And so uh, I was saying at the beginning that over beyond this introduction to architecture strategies and architecture style, I wanted to introduce yourself all the Max package and the software that integrates in fact a modular strategy. So um, I like to talk about widget programming. Why? Since, for example, Max 7 appeared on the market in 2007. In 2009, it was Max 6. In 2013, sorry. We can see that on the left frame of each patcher, we have the access to a collection of snippets. And uh, since a commercial uh, agreement, cycling made before going inside the uh, Ableton, the BEEP modular collection has been integrated. Is a collection of modules that, that, that are ready to use. Just a moment, somebody wants to give me something? Uh, uh, sorry, okay, thanks. I was just outside of camera. So, um, is a collection of modules well, ready to use that we can simply connect Ta -ta, ta -ta, it's very used, and we have some classic, uh, some classic treatments, and we have um, a module for the audio input, a module for the audio output, uh, and the most classical things that we can use for, 
for manipulate and for analyzing the audio signal. Um, Beep Modular has been, sorry, has been developed in Berkeley and is a very nice, uh, a very nice collection. Why Max decided, and Fat Cycling decided to integrate formally um, this external modular connection just to enlarge the base of potential users because we think that just unfed people who is studying electronic music at the, at the conservatory, at the university, or composers in, interested in electronic music could be interested in Max, but if we really think there is a much more larger public that, for example, makes uh, uh, sound installation, that makes uh, sound sculptures, that may, yeah, that makes visual, per, yeah, visual performance that can use ready-to-use modules just in order to have simple treatments that can be integrated in our um, for a much more larger uh, performance. Okay, so let's go on. And this is another one that we can find. All these are for free. And these tools was, was developed in Birmingham. And it's just, in fact, if you want to download them, you make, in fact, these tools, Birmingham, and you will find the link to download. Um, it's, it's quite similar to, to this. Let's say that each university with an equipe that was interested in live electronics and programming in Max, all these things running Max. Um, were developing their own collections, but let's say that most of them make the same things. It's just, in fact, some of them work better, some of them focuses more on a nice graphic user interface, some of them uh, focus more on the complexity of the algorithm, and maybe the user interface is a little bit less and yeah, yeah, let's say user friendly, it depends. Another system that was developed in Montreal at the, at the University of Montreal is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is the laptop. Another system is called CLEF. The difference in CLEF is that we have a general, uh, we can see, in fact, you see the white window with that blue boxes. In fact, when we build the network or the modules we are recalling, we have the graphic connection about how the modules have been connected among themselves. And we have an external manager that allows the implementation, for example, of uh, BPF lines, BPF files that can rule the, the audio treatments that we are using on that moment. A very nice project was called Yamoma, and I'm sorry, in fact, it was the, the last release was in 2015, uh, the version, I think it was the version 0.6.8, and Yamoma was an open source project in the sense that everybody with some skills in C++ programming could take part in this project, and really, I advise you to download this collection and to have a look to some models, because, because really, some some of them works perfectly. It's just that in both in Clef and in Yamoma, you must accept to use some external objects different than the standard Max library. Another collection on the market is called the Nagio Max interface that is part of the IRCAM forum and has been conceived and developed by Jean Lochard. For, for, a technical, for a technical point of view, it makes the same things that make all the, all the other modular collection. We have the envelope follower, the pitch shifter, we have the compressor, we have uh, simply reverberation module, etc. It's just, in fact, uh, another company that made a quite similar project. 
If we think about software that integrate a modular strategy beyond the use of Max, one nice software I advise you to investigate is called Integral Life. Is I don't think it's difficult to use a couple of days and you are quite well trained in using it. And you can see how you can physically connect audio treatments so to build your own pipeline and structure. We can run several parallel pipeline and structure in order to have several audio streamings working together at the same time. We just have a standard connection of treatments in the sense that we cannot imagine to implement our own treatments. We talk about pitch shift, we talk about reverberation, and we talk about uh, stereo panning, etc. So these are things that anyway um, does not allow a true freedom, but that anyway are quite sufficient, for example, for performing all the mixed music pieces that appeared in the history until the end of the 80s, where we just have pitch shift, uh, ring modulation, etc. Anyway, uh, we have some classical treatments that are always the same and that can be applied to, I think, 99% of that pieces until a true, uh, a true live electronics programming was not possible, and it was possible just since the 95, 96, not before. So, another software that is anyway Max based. What does it mean? It's that PSoft is a um, how is called um, is a standalone application of Max and is the software part of a machine that is called Sampo. The Sampo is a machine with this series of MIDI pedals that work for moving some parameters. It's a very simple machine that was conceived just for, um, for updating in with one system uh, all the historical French mixed music pieces uh, of the 60s and the 70s, where we just have pitch shift, reverberation, and stereo panning. At the end, it was just this. Um, one software that has a free release and also a commercial one that costs $399. It's using Hollyhook. It's a super nice software that also integrates the possibility to communicate visual um, and audio. So we also have a video part and for example we can program, we can script uh, um, some, um, some video responsive when performing an audio, what does it mean? It, it means that I can program some graphics, uh, some textures that can be modified according to, the, to an audio streaming, and we can make all these things just using this software. At, for having all the features, we must pay, pay, but if I should spend some money, I advise uh, any way to think about this software that is very, very, very nice, very well done. Always the strategy is anyway, we can see the pipeline it when we talk about one track and the modular strategy when we talk about the, the connection of several functions that we can recall and put along the chain as we want, as we need. I can move, for example, the module that is concerning a compression or a spectral transformation and put it before the compression uh, or after the compression uh, according with what I need. Uh, very quickly, in fact, this is just, uh, I will give anyway the PDF of, of my presentation and this is the quality comparison of all the connection I was talking about. So finally, let's talk quickly about, in fact, let's make an introduction to Mix, that is my, connect, my collection, and this afternoon we will try, we will learn, in fact, how to use it and how to build quickly a concert patcher. Um, let's start to say at the beginning why I wanted to program and to conceive and to share with everybody at the end uh, what, I th what at the beginning it was a true personal need.
moment I, I'm making some troubles and now all things will fall down if I don't. Oh, okay. Stop. Just a moment. I think, is it right? So, um, we should ask at the beginning what is a concert patcher. I say don't fit mixed is a max package to build a concert patcher. Maybe you know, know what is a concert patcher, maybe not, it depends. And anyway, it's not uh, uh, it's normal to not know what it what it is really a French tradition that has been applied for the French music, the French mixed music, especially developed at the Ircam during the 90s and the 2000s. Um, is the only way when we think about concert patcher to design a digital signal pattern in Max? No, but, uh, but I think is the most useful in the sense is the most linear and most proper. Um, mixed uh, can be applied to every piece. Uh, yes, absolutely yes. Is so simple and so outside the conceiving of the audio treatments that anyway can be applied to every piece from the past and from the future. Um, is just in fact a project for mixed music with N live sources, both audio mid, OSC, etc sound installation, and other music uh, hybrid situation, let's say like this. Uh, a concert patcher phases the organization of the data signal routing inside a max patcher. So, so max patcher is the resume of several models that work together for the same goal. What is the goal? To perform our piece. Uh, normally, every concert patcher is based on a pipeline and architecture, and we saw what does it mean. We have some events, the so-called uh, event of our Q list, that are a sort of list of presets with some structure that can affect the state of our algorithm and the behavior of our graphic controls. So let's say that the computer score can affect both the model and the view through the scripting of controls. The computer score is what I just said, I don't want to repeat again. And musicians on stage or backstage trigger the sequence of events through MIDI data or, or by using uh, uh, human interfaces. In case of use of the score following, like Antescofo or other score following algorithms, the pitch recognition replaces this activity in order to make the reading of the computer score automatic along the performance of the piece. Three things when we talk about concert patcher. A concert patcher must be Deterministic, what does it mean? Must always be the same things every time we run the software. If we are not sure about what will go on, it means that our programming is bad. A good software always makes the same thing. And it must be predictive, what does it mean? That before to trigger the events, we must know what will happen. And it must always happen the same things, even changing whole, or, or, or even changing performer, in the sense that I, I can have the same piece performed by Mario or performed by Luisa. And if things changing according to the, per, the performance of Mario or, or, the per, or Luisa's ones, it means that something is wrong in my programming. Uh, uh, Sometimes I say to say to some students of mine, no, 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 uh, I had trouble because, because of Luisa's performance. No, you had troubles because of your bad programming. 99% of times it's just like this. And a very nice rule that can be applied uh, by managing our flat 
by managing our bedroom or managing our software. A place for everything and everything in its place. I just have a module for the audio input. I just have a part of the software for the audio output. I just have one part of the software for recalling all the sound files. When I start to have something on the left, something on the right, a little bit more on the bottom, a little bit more on other part, it's quite difficult to make a debug when a trouble is going on. And that trouble can always appear because anyway we talk about software. So why I, why I made and fed this job? I, had, uh, I have the chance to have a lot of music pieces to write and I was a little bit tired to start, I start conceiving mixed, it was 2014. And I had a moment in which I had two months, three pieces to write, I really had no time to make three softwares from the beginning. And so I said, this is the last time I do it. And so I started the, the months after that very dramatic period <laughs> to conceive a basic library that can be a good start for every piece I had to write later. Um, a lot of parts, the less significant maybe, but anyway necessary, are always the same in every concert patcher. But normally what changes in a concert patcher? For sure it changes the number of inputs, the number of outputs, the MIDI setup, the treatments, uh, it's normal. And we use a different computer score, so a different list of instructions. But in a music software for live electronics, it never changed the patcher settings messages, the DSP monitor, security tricks, graphical interfaces, and all the things I wrote there. So we don't need to make every time the same things if we always use them in the same way. So we say in fact these are the connection. Visual is the only that I did not mean, but Visual is a modular connection for video treatment and is also integrated, directly integrated on the left frame of each Max Patcher since Max 7 appeared on the market. All this connection anyway talk about the same thing. Classic audio treatment, etc. But I must say, me personally, considering me a composer with some skills in Max, I would never use ready to use homogenizzati, we say in Italian, ready to use models um, for my own live electronics. I always want to have a low control for all the things I want to implement in my own softwares. So, no collection that was already in the market before I was conceiving Mixed was caring about software architecture in Max. How to distribute, how to rule the signal path in a concert patcher. So Mix just make this and responds to the three main criteria I, we were saying at the beginning, so, so the modifiability, because we can adapt each concert patcher according with our local needs for that special piece we, we are conceiving on. We can reuse anyway the same modules in different pieces because, because anyway they just contain data and, and they just host what we want to program locally. And my collection, let's say, that is not scared about next Max re releases because it has been made with only the standard Max library without no external objects. In this way, we are sure that anyway, with next releases, we will have no troubles. So let's say that we only have architectural frameworks and we have what I like to call the max transformation from software to middleware. So we have something that is a little bit harder, 
but at the same time, we have the possibility, if we want to change every model and make it according with our personal needs, without affecting the recording, the recording of models for next releases. No signal transformation, no audio treatments, so nothing that makes sound. It's just the Mary Poppins part. We just put order in a patcher, and I think that that somehow, when order becomes a main strategy, order is sexy. It's something that really makes things proper, and uh, a proper patch makes the programming easier, the debugging easier, and the quality of the audio signal maybe also better, because we can know that where focusing, we're applying all our energies in case of need, in case of troubles. Uh, a lot of time when we have, for example, some troubles such as uh, glitches uh, or peaks, sometimes it can also depend from a bad pathing of the signals. So this is something that through the use of mix, we theoretically solve. And I think it's something that is made from a composer for other composer in the sense I like to share my things once I made anyway. I'm not a jealous person. So uh, if we think about in fact, the, the design pattern, the um, mixed is based on a MVP strategy. What does it mean? It means that once that you have recalled all the snippets that you want to implement in your Max Concert Patcher, you must use the presentation mode in order to really perform the, the graphic using the user interface. So let's say that this is the classical chain that we can have. So, so, let's make a little carousel about the different strategies that we will see this afternoon, practically and fed by patching together. So, I can simply have an audio input that goes in, in an output. Or I can have a, an audio input that is transformed somehow with some treatments that are not already in my modules, but that I will feel by hand personally, according to the need of that moment. Or, for example, I want to read some sound files. It is also possible, for sure. And these are more complex architecture that I, that I can have according with my needs and according with the models I all the time recall. We have now, I think that in my website, you can find the version that I call it the 0 0.5, something like this. I hope in a couple of months, as soon as I finish some pieces to write, as soon as I, I have time, there will be another release of Mix with much more modules. I think I will add eight, ten modules that have been suggested by people started to use in these two years on fed my collection. So this is, for example, another one that is a little bit larger, and the wall strategy is this one, so where we all have all the 17 modules, I'm sorry, all the 17 modules working together. So let's say mixed and fat is as simple as possible in the sense that when I will open some modules, you will say, oh, oh, it's so simple, and the reason for which each model is so simple is just to make you trusty in using the models because all the creative part of the patcher, it will be anyway or your own charge. So this is the list of modules that we right have in the actual release of Mix and you just read by yourself. So I think that at the moment is enough, and this afternoon, in fact, I will show you how to recall the things, and we will make some experiences using um, the collection and trying to make together a concert patcher. You have some questions. I will be glad to answer you, please. Thank you. 
Can you put a little bit more voice, please? Just a moment, wait for a microphone, thanks. Thank you. So I said that you said a lot of interesting things at the beginning because uh, you were talk talking about the portability. Yes. But Max is not that much portable. And I was thinking about why you don't write all your models inside the code books. So like a user like me that likes to know how it's made has possibility to, to do it and to transport it like in Faust or in other programs. So you have just the algorithm clear so you can use it wherever. So. I decided to make this in Max just because I wanted to make it in Max because I use Max. So I said that at the beginning I was making this just for myself and after I, uh, I was sharing my own software just because, because I'm not jealous of my things. But anyway, it was at the beginning a personal need. Um, there are two different things. One thing is the model behind, so this is the reason for which Mixed is based on a strong conceiving of software architecture and we can translate the same software architecture in different software in the sense that even if you use pure data or even if you want to code a new software or use a new software that will appear on the market in the future, anyway, the software architecture will not change. I'm quite sure of this. But and the application case that is mixed at the end, it's just local and is just now, now implemented in Max. Okay, it's nice, but if you, you say about Max, but we talk about algorithms, modules. Model is, is not in, just in some Max, but I can have it wherever. So it's nice to have uh, pre-made models by a composer, because I do it for myself. I have my library. I don't use other libraries, because I prefer to, to see what is inside. But if you have the strings code, it's clear to see. No, on this no. I disagree. It's not clear to see, in the sense that Anyway, also code depends from the, from the operating system, so there is no one strategy that is completely safe and that is not scared about the, the changing on the time. Um, you was talking uh, about unfettered model. This is the point. Mix, my collection does not contain models. You will be charged to make yours. It's just unfettered mixed in the MVP design pattern just contain unfettered controls, but not the models. So it does not contain all the, 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 the strategies that are concerning the audio treatment, for example. So we have no model, we just have control and view. Okay, because use max object inside. But yes. max objects are already made with their uh, preferences that we can't see. Yeah, but uh, like a on big, this so moment, sorry. I think that anyway, you know, the use of code should answer to something that it does not exist on the market. As, uh, otherwise, it's just being fanatic. So uh, I don't think I'm fanatic. I don't want to script every time something that is like the, the hot water. If I already hot water, I just use it. So, so I, I don't feel the need to make from the beginning uh, everything just because I said I, uh, I, I really made by yourself. Uh, if I have something that is working and is ready to use, I just use it. And I use code just for that part that does not exist. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. And are there some other questions? Okay, so guys, I say thank you, and we see at uh, two o'clock or half past two, I don't know. Is at two o'clock.
Okay, see you at two o'clock in the back part of the stage. Yeah, thank you.